385,000. 385,000 people are born every single day. As you're watching this very video, someone is being born. May 30th, 1990. People are born as they always are. However, this day would, unbeknownst to the rest of the world, be the very day that a particular person would enter the earth. A person whom can only be described as perplexing, bigoted, and contentious, with a devastating story following them everywhere they would go, seeping into the strangest corners of the internet, and touching thousands, for better or for worse. To Philadelphia sports fans, she was known as the Pistachio Girl. To the internet, she was known as the creator of Alfred Alfer. Her name is Emily Yukis, and she wants you to know two things. She hates minorities and loves Skibbity Toilet. <laughs> The internet undoubtedly has a parasitic relationship with every single one of its users. Many people argue that for them, the internet acts as a symbiotic companion instead, in the sense that yes, even if the internet is objectively horrible, many people still get things out of it. Money, validation, fame, acceptance, and while I can definitely understand this argument, all of these things still come at a price. For many, this sacrifice doesn't come at much, either because their internet presence is much too small, or because they're blessed with skin too thick to let anything else influence them, but many, many others aren't able to feel this luxury. Yet, when the internet was just beginning to bloom, the environment was vastly different. Just about everyone and anyone got along, regardless of opinion, political view, or identity. Hateful words were seldom exchanged, and it was a beautiful place for creations to flourish at the beginning of the 21st century. Everything was innocently beautiful, eerily peaceful, and no, I'm totally kidding, it was an absolute cesspit. Although internet users weren't nearly as knowledgeable of the online world then as they are now, the environment of online communication in the early 2000s was vastly different from the internet the way it is today. You can't really blame people for being edgy pieces of shit on the internet 10 to 20 years ago because, well, that was the way everyone was. Enter Newgrounds, originally referred to as Newground, a website launched in 1995 by a young Tom Fulp that originated as a fan magazine for a gaming console that would evolve into the most popular way to share art, browser games, and animations, and anything similar in the early 2000s. Tom Fulp would create the first browser games available on the website, games that would instantly let the climate of the website be known to people stumbling across it. These games would include Club a Seal, a controversial game about, well, clubbing a seal, Assassin, a game where you kill celebrities and pop culture characters, and probably the most infamous and most insensitive and offensive, Pico's School, a game that would release three months after the most infamous school history is a direct response to the tragedy, and it was, uh... <laughs> Insane, to put it lightly. Despite its offensive nature, Pico School was, at the time, the most advanced browser game ever made, and although it's relatively unknown what people thought of this game at the time, as the website lacked many communicative features, Pico has since gone on to be one of the site's mascots, experiencing a resurgence of popularity in recent times thanks to <coughs> the Wretched Rhythm Game. These early games and animations created by the site's creator would quickly set a standard for humor on the website, humor that would begin to blossom with the arrival of the 21st first century, and the arrival of other users and communication features being added to Newgrounds. Games, art, and animation would begin to sow their seeds in the code of the newly named Newgrounds.com, going on to create worlds within its code. Newgrounds was a, essentially a combination of YouTube and Twitter, two of the scariest websites to be on, before either of them were conceived. Salad Fingers, Madness Combat, Tank Man, and recently the Wretched Rhythm Game are some of the many pillars of the website, known to many of its inhabitants. And while most of the themes seen within the more popular works were definitely more edgy and disturbing, they typically wouldn't stray past the line of sexual themes, slurs, and derogatory terms, real-life tragedies, violence, whatever. And yes, these topics are pretty damn bad and typically not super socially acceptable nowadays, but they would seem tame and even welcomed and joyous in comparison to what other users would unleash upon the website. By 2005, the website had been up, running, and popular for a while. Many animations and games posted had warranted their own fan bases and would be praised and beloved by many. The site was undeniably in its prime, and in October of 2005, a 15-year-old hailing from Philadelphia would create a Newgrounds account, a decision that would change her life, and many others, more than she could have ever known that fateful day. This 15-year-old would be one Emily Yukis, just another
popular kid on the internet sharing their creativity. Her story is a cautionary tale, one that, while not untold, could always use more exposure. This, my friends, is the story of one of Emily Yukis's disturbing creations, a series starring a mentally unstable and disturbed dog with a dissociative disorder known to the internet as Alfred Alfer, and the story of Alfred's Playhouse, a story of tragedy, abuse, indoctrination, and insanity. The character of Alfred Alpher is nothing recent, having existed for almost 20 years at this point, so it may be confusing as to why I've decided to talk about this today. Firstly, Emily Yukis for a while has stayed off of mainstream social media or any kind of social platform that isn't hosted by an alt-right group of people. However, as of recently, with the rise of the Alfred Alpher character, specifically on websites like TikTok, she has been appearing yet again, and it seems that a lot of people in her comments are uninformed, to say the least. Second, this is a topic that is interested me for years at this point, one that has always served as a warning to me. It's something I've always wanted to talk about in a video essay format, even before I knew I would actually end up making video essays. And yes, I understand that this topic is definitely not suited to my usual content at this point in time. I acknowledge that, but my channel has never been about what's appropriate to the algorithm. I don't really care about views or likes, I simply do whatever the fuck I want. I don't owe my audience anything. And I'm sorry if that disappoints you, but I never expected to have an audience, even if it's small, to begin with. I started making videos to talk about things I was interested in, and I continue to make videos because of the same reason. I do not owe you people anything, I don't know who you are, let me be autistic in peace. Plus, I try to market my channel primarily towards horror and internet nostalgia related topics, and well, I would honestly consider this video to be about both. I can think of little more horrifying than the public descent of a talented creator. I included a disclaimer at the beginning, as I do in all of my videos, but for for those of you who just put my videos on in the background while drawing. Hi, by the way, you're doing great. You're so talented. What, what, are you, what are you drawing? Can I see? Let me explicitly state that this video may be extremely distressing to some. Hell, even researching this video has taken a slight toll on my mental health. If any of these topics would upset you to the point of it being harmful to yourself, please skip out on this video. I appreciate your support, but it's not worth your own safety. Please contact someone if you're suffering or in need of professional guidance. You aren't alone. Assault and rape. Ne NSFW content involving fictional animals, NSFW, racism, derogatory slurs, Nazism, white supremacy, self-harm, violence, mentioned blood and gore, and flashing lights. If you're interested in disturbing videos and stories and edutainment, but can't actually stomach anything downright visually, uh, disgusting, then I guess this is the video for you. I'll cover pretty much everything so that you don't have to seek out this content yourself, as it is definitely not for the faint of heart. That being said, let me tell you the story of a dog named Alfred, and the twisted, suffering mind that conceived him. Emily Yukis grew up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, born in 1990 to a family we don't know too much about. We know she has a brother, a mother, and has stated that her father is dead to her and has been for a very, very long time. She makes it apparent that she had no prominent male authority or parental figure in her life. She would make an account on Newgrounds when she was only 15 years old, fresh out of middle school. Like many growing girls, Emily Yukis had a large dollhouse growing up in which she would play with a multitude of toys. She particularly she particularly describes two ceramic dog figurines that her stories and games would typically revolve around. Throughout middle school, she would spend a large amount of time playing with these two characters, characters that she named Fat Dog and Shizzle, two characters described as, in her own words, gangsta dogs, who would frequently spend time doing, buying, and selling the devil's lettuce, as well as hanging out with any dolls that Emily could get her hands on. She had a clear passion for creating absurd and edgy characters. At the age of 14, Emily would discover Macromedia Flash, and took a week-long class to learn how to create cartoons using the program. She immediately picked up animation, needing nothing else besides this week-long class in order to learn how to create her own animated cartoons. As soon as she picked up the talent, she was immediately inspired and thrilled, describing it as magic, allowing her to make her dreams come true. She would begin her animation journey by creating cartoons based on the stories she would tell and the games she would play in her dollhouse, her own personal playhouse. She would post her first animation on October 13th, 2005, a cartoon simply titled, uh, Osama Gets Low. If I have to explain to you who that person is, you're probably too young to be watching this. Hello, everybody. Do you like to see pop culture icons made fun of and disrespected? Well, 
Well then, this is the movie for you. Fat Dog and his pals take you down the toilet on a journey through pop culture land. Complete with Osama Bin Laden, Michael Jackson, Saddam Hussein, with his lover, Doritos, Conan O'Brien, Carl Penn, and John Heater. Plus a pothead Teletubby, an alcoholic Furby, and the underwater sex god Father Oceana. Oh, just for the record, I have nothing against Conan O'Brien, Carl Penn, or John Heater. This description of the animation is definitely the best basis we have for the actual quote-unquote plot of this first video, as the actual animation is, well, completely unintelligible. I couldn't tell you what is happening at any given moment here. The animation is essentially an animated music video to the song Get Low by Lil Jon and the East Side Boys, and begins with the character Fat Dog uh, lip-syncing to the song while sitting atop a toilet. This is the same Fat Dog portrayed by Emily's ceramic dog toys in middle school. The animation is crude, low quality, and incredibly difficult to make out, giving it that charming early 2000s edge. Another dog shows up on screen for a moment, this being the the other toy dog from Emily's dollhouse, Shizzle. This character in particular is very, very important. The rest of this animation features Fat Dog, Shizzle, and everyone mentioned in the description of the animation, dancing around, lip syncing, making crude movements and gestures, and participating in the maximum amount of nonsense you could expect them to. We see some jabs at the police and police brutality, an excessive amount of naughty substances, and eye-bleeding flashing lights that I will not show to you for your own good. This first video is isn't really remarkable and is really just a scary, random, but otherwise inoffensive animation compared to what Emily would soon become of. Sometime in 2005, presumably after the creation of Osama Gets Low, as seen by the change in animation quality, Emily would create another animation that would go unreleased. The animation once again follows Fat Dog and Shizzle, this time around buying a laser pointer from a dollar store and harassing civilians with it. Emily's next animation, however, would feature a reimagined version of the character Shizzle. Shizzle was essentially a prototype to this new character, something stated by Emily herself, and this new character would immediately go on to be Emily's most popular, infamous, and beloved creation by a long shot. This single animation marks the beginning of Alfred Alfer. Alfred's first appearance as Alfred, Alfred Gets Fixed, is a short standing at around 1 minute and 44 seconds, and stands as not only Alfred's first proper appearance, but his first focal appearance as well. In this video, Alfred is at the hospital, strapped to a board, and preparing to get neutered. The song, Chariots of Fire plays in the background, a song that Emily claims had inspired her creative flame since the moment she heard it. She always found it to be a beautiful song, especially in the movies that featured it, but knew that her vision for it was even more beautiful, even more ambitious and meaningful. This short essentially acts as her own vision and interpretation of the song, a work that she seemed to be quite proud of. Alfred studies his surroundings, calculating a way to escape before his balls get chopped. He neutralizes his doctor before anything happens, breaking free from his confinement and running through the halls of of a human hospital? As he runs through the hall, going through with his great escape, he's cheered on by other patients as well as Fat Dog, and Alfred makes it out of the emergency room. In the distance, he can see a gorgeous horizon, a beautiful sky and landscape that stretches on for centuries. He leaps with all his might, prepared to soar out of the window while Fat Dog cheers him on. However, this paradise unbeknown to Alfred is only a billboard on a building across the street, and as soon as Alfred jumps out the window, he promptly falls from a massive height and splats onto the sidewalk. This short, although surrounding a dog falling to his death in order to escape being fixed, is surprisingly inoffensive, and genuinely serves as a rather amusing and entertaining animated short. This period of normalcy would not last, however, as Emily's next animation, simply titled uh, that, I'm not saying that out loud, so you can you can look at the screen, would take a very depraved, inappropriate approach, although her now infamous animation and movie making style would not yet be conned. Jesus Christ Star released on March 12th, 2007, a parody of Jesus Christ Superstar. Emily has explained that Jesus Christ Superstar was one of her biggest inspirations, being the reason that she learned how to sing. Music and singing is a very apparent talent of Emily's, something that she is exceedingly gifted at. Her voice, while back then being very frantic and scratchy, genuinely holds the capacity to create beautiful melodies. Emily would provide some uh, essential background information on her animation. Peter, Paul Thomas slash Philip Thomas from the 1971 version of the film Jesus Christ Superstar happens to be a star. One day, he takes Alfred the dog back to his porn directing lair and odd things ensue. Note, I am not saying that Paul Thomas is a dog right 
her. The summary of this short is pretty much entirely explained here. Midway through the short, Jesus shows up and breaks the scene up before anything traumatic can happen to Alfred, and although nothing is explicitly shown, it's still a very strange thing for a 15-year-old to be animating and posting on the internet. Although this could just be chalked up to Emily's dark sense of humor and the overall edgy climate of Newgrounds at the time. It didn't really necessarily mean anything was wrong or that Emily was in a really bad mental state, because surely, well, everyone was like this at the time. So as such, people didn't really raise any eyebrows, and Emily's passion for animation would continue as always. Her first attempt at a full-length cartoon with a coherent plotline would come to light on June 21st of 2007, being rather appropriately titled The Rise of Alfred. When Alfred Alfred the Mentally Ill Dog gets promoted to the manager of Burrito Bell, flashbacks of a neglectful and unloving childhood haunt him and give him an idea to rule as dictator. Alfred uses his burnt-out employees as love pods in his sick and twisted desire to fill the emptiness of childhood and to be loved. Oh, yes, did I mention that Alfred has multiple personality disorder, and he could talk to his dictator alter, and that Hitler and Stalin's souls are stuck in his head for all of eternity and can control him too. If that description doesn't leave you desperately invested and curious, I've no idea what will. The short begins with an inattentive Alfred zoning out whilst another character's dialogue is muffled, slowly fading in to reveal that Alfred has been promoted to the new manager of Burrito Bell, a fast food chain parroting Taco Bell. At first, Alfred is very confused, not fully realizing the announcement in front of him, although the realization that he has become the manager suddenly sinks in, causing Alfred to once again tune out every word from anyone else. Upon becoming manager, Alfred receives a cool pin with his name on it, as well as a personalized nameplate on his own desk, reading Manager Alfred Alfer. Alfred seems astonished at this revelation, exercising the possibilities that becoming a manager can bring. It's immediately evident that becoming the manager of a fast food restaurant, to Alfred at least, equates to complete and total power, and that the line between manager and dictator is is hardly visible. Alfred reminisces on his troubled past, his isolation showing throughout. The first thing we can see from his prolonged memory trip is him being left all alone on his birthday, a sad cake placed in front of him, the camera panning off to the side where a note is stuck to the fridge. No, not with a cookie monster magnet. That reads, Alfred, we went to the rodeo. We probably will never come back. Love, mom and dad. Alfred was completely abandoned by his parents on his birthday, left alone and miserable. We're shown that Alfred oh so desperately craves affection and proper intimacy two things he's never received from anyone ever through his past actions, such as spying on happy couples and even trying to, uh, emulate said actions with a watermelon. The more Alfred reflects on his past, the more deranged and intense he begins to appear. When reflecting on all of his previous moments of isolation and self-pity, Alfred realizes that by becoming a dictator and having complete power, he'll be beloved, and all will give him love, respect, and complete total control and power. Emily Yukis has stated that this particular scene was inspired by by herself and her own isolation growing up, confirming that Emily didn't really have any friends and grew up completely alone. The things Alfred does in this scene aren't things that Emily would actually do, obviously, but things she feels she would have done if she was a cartoon dog. This is like, this is how, this is how I was. I was an isolate. I had no friends. No, I didn't do any of this stuff. I didn't like watch people have sex, but I would have if I was a cartoon dog. In a way, this was likely her way of coping and a way of introducting herself into her cartoons. Regardless, Alfred becomes ecstatic at the thought of his new management position, and we cut to him introducing himself to the other employees. Hello, everybody. I'm your new manager, Alfred Alfred. But you will call me Dictator Alfred. And you will love me. And you will love me. And you will learn a song to welcome your great dictator. Me. You will learn it by heart! And you will sing along too. We love Alfred, we treasure him above us. Alfred starts singing a song that he expects his employees to memorize, a song about loving him, treasuring him, worshipping him, and very quickly makes his own securities known. His song cuts away to him talking about how tacos are a prime example of the ideal food, but the hamburger is far inferior, a disgusting food that must be eliminated. This is the first noticeable appearance of Alfred's disassociative disorder. I'm going to go ahead and note here that while a lot of aspects of Alfred's multiple personality disorder, which I'll be referring to 
as DID, may be accurate and comforting to people who have similar mental instabilities, Emily Yukis does not have DID or any form of multiple personalities. There are a lot of aspects of DID that are portrayed inaccurately or offensively throughout her cartoons. However, everyone's experience is different and unique. What I'm trying to say here is it's a cartoon dog with a mental disorder being used typically for comedic effect. And obviously not everyone who has DID has an evil dictator alter and fucked up alter egos who do really horrible things, as we'll see later in Emily's work. However, relating to aspects of Alfred's dissociative disorder doesn't make you a horrible person, and fuck anyone who tells you that. Got it? Got it. Alfred's established alter, Dictator Alfred, consistently interrupts Alfred's other personalities, multiple of them conflicting. Alfred then asks for 200 hamburgers, and any last ounce of coherency begins to slip away at the audience's fingertips. The overstimulating, horrifyingly confusing nature of this scene would go on to become Emily's signature style of filmmaking, a type of aesthetic that she claims her and her brother discovered that they would refer to as bombardism, a rather appropriate term for this style of art. Flashing colors, random movements, pop culture characters appearing and disappearing at random, offensive imagery, violence, and of course, distorted, bit-crushed audio clipping in and out. This style would immediately resonate with people at mass, something that was acclaimed as being hilariously creative by Newgrounds users, and Emily would go on to utilize this style in other works to portray genuine mental anguish. Back to the animation, however, we cut to Alfred plastering up posters for the restaurant, once again starting to fantasize about being beloved, being followed, and even being religiously worshipped, before phasing into yet another mental breakdown from Alfred. Alfred is pressured into believing that the employees are plotting against him by his dictator alter, instructing Alfred to dispose of them before they can harm him. Emily has stated that this is her own understanding of dictators. They are incredibly paranoid, hungry with their own power, and feel as if the people under their dictatorship wish to betray them, making them do the things that they do. Emily also explained that, to her at least, dictators just wanted to be loved, and she really couldn't understand why they would kill people if they just wanted love. This is what this is what Stalin did. He got too paranoid that everyone was gonna kill him, so he just killed all everyone, and then there was no one left to even be his followers. So you researched this one. Yeah, not even, like, on purpose. Well, some of it was on purpose, yeah, but... A Burrito Bell employee enters the room, and Dictator Alfred, along with controversial historical bad people, once again attempt to encourage Alfred to dispose of his followers. The employee's cell phone starts ringing, and the overstimulation drives Alfred to madness. He begins slaughtering the Burrito Bell employees in a fit of insanity, rocking back and forth and sobbing once he's realized what he's done. Now there's no one left to love him, and he's all alone. He's all alone. No one else is left. There are no other survivors. His mood instantly shifts. His isolation becomes something that makes him feel glorious. The realization that he's the only one left brings him a new sense of power, and Dictator Alfred appears to completely take over Alfred's mind, twitching maniacally at his own gloriousness, being completely transported into his own mind. There's something so interesting about the reason why this animation exists. Interesting about Emily's own takeaway from this project. This is her own view on the consequences of power and the way it corrupts a person, the way attention and love can bring out the worst in someone. In her words, it's so simple to not fall into this pattern, and yet no one ever learns. But she claimed that she was going to. I suppose we'll just have to wait and see if she stays true to her word. Rise of Alfred would quickly become Emily's most popular animation to date, being front page of the week of it releasing. People quickly began to adore Alfred Alfer and the distinct style of the short, finding this mentally challenged dog absolutely hilarious. Emily would make a new post on August 11th, 2007, acknowledging her newfound support and announcing a new project revolving entirely around Alfred, his trauma, his instabilities, and his insanity. Hi, people. There will be more Alfred Alfer, the narcissistic masochist dog. I promise you. However, the project I've been working on involving an Orwellian mind warp has gone into a rut, so I am starting on a new one with Alfred, Alfred's Playhouse, which involves lots of sexual abuse. I am extremely excited at the idea of having a show on here starring Alfred. I just need to get rid of my anxiety and futile self-pity cycles. My goal is to make a fucked up, disturbing, trippy series that will peel away at Alfred's mind layers. The news post then devolves into talking about Laverenti Beria for some reason, I, I don't know. Nevertheless, 11 days after her news post, her final animation before Alfred's Playhouse would be posted, titled Perpetual Limbo of Room. The short features Alfred and Fat Dog in a barren room watching
watching TV while Alfred repeatedly rocks back and forth and Fat Dog smokes. The short is essentially a loop of this while miscellaneous advertisements appear on the television, and Alfred begins to elucidate absurdities around him. Emily would describe the short as something that is, at the end of the day, absolutely meaningless, but looks as if it could mean something on a deeper level. It looks as if it has some deeper or obscure meaning, but in reality is, well, nothing. Eventually, Alfred starts frantically pacing around and humming maniacally, eventually approaching a door only to discover there is no escape. After the release of this short, Emily would begin production on her newly announced project, spending the next three and a half months putting her everything into a three-part animation that she could be proud of. People wouldn't receive any updates until December 19th, 2007, in which Emily would share some thrilling news with her supporters. Hello, everybody. I have fantastic news. I believe this Alfred's Playhouse will be released the first part this Friday. This Friday! Then the second on Saturday and the third on Sunday. Oh, hurrah! Oh, I have been working three and a half, perhaps more months on this. And I am of the excitement. Oh, of the joy. One day would pass, and Emily would stay true to her word. The very first episode of Alfred's Playhouse, releasing onto new grounds on December 20th, 2007. Alfred's Playhouse is, without a doubt, Emily Yukis's most popular work to date. Hell, it's in the title of this video just because it's better for search terms. Emily justifiably considers this to be the big one, her magnum opus of sorts. A lot of people have heard about Alfred's Playhouse on a surface level, and over the past few years, the series has received newfound popularity, particularly on TikTok, popularity that has managed to accumulate into an entire fandom of sorts. In some aspects, Alfred's Playhouse is a deeply touching and disturbingly accurate portrayal of S.A., and in other aspects, it's, well, it, it's sure like that. The best way to understand the series is to just dive into it headfirst, starting with Alfred's Playhouse, episode one. The first episode begins with a disturbing reimagining of the theme song from Pee-wee's Playhouse, a children's television series. This was inspired by Emily having seen the show while tripping. The lyrics tell a story of Alfred's horrifying fantasy world, his mental playhouse, a a safe place for him to dissociate to when life gets too difficult to face. Anyone who uses dissociation to cope with their trauma can easily relate to and even find solace in this introduction. It's made apparent that Alfred specifically uses this kind of amusing denial in order to distance himself from abuse, a tactic that many survivors have unfortunately been forced to utilize themselves. The tone of Alfred's playhouse, if not already established from the very beginning, is… um… Absurd, to say the least. Constant repetition, information and sensory overload, crude early 2000s visuals, everything about it evokes a sense of genuine panic and confusion. A perfect example of disturbing the comforted and comforting the disturbed. Alfred begins to speak of a secret word, a word that Alfred claims they scream upon hearing. Today's secret word is popsicle. We are shown a flashback, a look into Alfred's mind, his previous life. Alfred sits in front of a TV screen, absurdly close to the television. He is holed up in an incredibly filthy room, and a voice starts to call him, addressing him as Pickles. The voice starts to ask what flavor of Popsicle Pickles wants. Alfred reaches out for the Popsicle, and the mysterious voice tells him to turn around. If it wasn't apparent, this scene is a representation of the popsicle is a code word for a certain body part with a similar shape, and this word also happens to be some kind of trigger word for Alfred, a word that he associates with these horrible memories. Upon hearing this trigger word and remembering a traumatic event, Alfred, as well as everything else in his imaginative world, begins to fall into a state of overwrought distress, panic, and unmistakable mental anguish. Sounds and colors, shapes and sights constantly repeating and distorting, it's an incredibly overstimulating sight to behold, and one that makes anyone with a slight slightly more fortunate mental state, uncomfortable. This is shown as a delivery man appears at Alfred's residence, and Alfred, in his state of dissociative instability, drags the unassuming man into his home and introduces him to the playhouse. The man is confused, horrified, and immediately assumes that Alfred is attempting to torture him out of money or something similar. In reality, Alfred likely just doesn't talk to any real person. Benny and the Jets by Elton John begins to play, and the first episode ends with both Alfred and the mailman lost in confusion, each having their own 
perspective breakdown. The first installment of Alfred's Playhouse is genuinely a very solid interpretation and exploration of trauma, and how a dissociative disorder may develop as a result of said trauma. Despite Emily's crude and often offensive style of animation, this episode wasn't nearly as brainlessly offensive and disgusting for no true purpose the way the majority of Emily's future animations would become. The second episode would still maintain these themes of escapism and tragedy, but definitely cranked up the offensive, hard-to-watch meter by a couple dozen notches. This episode is five minutes long and begins with Alfred explaining that he has a secret. The secret is that he has friends quite literally living in his walls. Immediately, these tiny critter-like friends run all over Alfred, causing yet another manic panic attack. These friends begin to maniacally hurt Alfred in almost every way possible, all while simply being disgusting in their own right. I won't describe nor show any of this because one, it makes me very uncomfortable, and two, YouTube would smite me for showing but a single frame. The rest of the video is almost entirely like this, just a gory, disgusting plea for help. Alfred eventually begins to graphically harm himself and explains that this is one of the only ways he could get attention, one of the only ways someone could show any form of care or concern for him in his constantly decaying mental state. A lot of people would assume this to be Alfred being manipulative and attempting to guilt trip every single person in his life through harming himself. And while this definitely isn't and will never be the way to go about getting attention when in a desperate moment, I highly doubt that Alfred did this out of manipulative intent. It was likely a desperate attempt for any kind of comfort, a kind of comfort that he could only barely glimpse whenever he happened to be in pain. While Alfred does this to himself, he appears to be in a rather childish state, possibly even being a different alter, a somewhat childish, feminine version of him. The episode ends with Alfred washing into a horrifying state of self-pity and a need for attention, all while the words poor Alfred repeat distorted in the background. We then make our way into Alfred's Playhouse Part 3, the final installment in the trilogy. This is the conclusion to the Alfred's Playhouse trilogy, melting into the whole of self-pity from a recent cutting frenzy. Alfred gets comfort from the love of his Playhouse friends, and yet again, the Playhouse is not all that it seems, except this time Alfred notices it. Another penetrating realization involving the Egberts means that Alfred knows too much, and has to get a visit from his alter personality, Dictator Alfred. Will Alfred stay in denial in the ignorant bliss of his Playhouse, or will he face his painful reality, the truth? And more importantly, will Dictator Alfred take power over Alfred? The beginning of the episode goes as described, including a very disturbing scene set to Black Dog by Led Zeppelin, featuring Alfred once again being, well, violated. In this scene, and multiple others, it's implied that this figure is likely the one responsible for Alfred's sexual trauma, and yes, that is Laverne Berea, don't think too much about it. After this gruesome scene takes place, presumably a glimpse into Alfred's horrible reality, Dictator Alfred approaches Alfred in his own conscience, telling him that he wasn't supposed to see that. He asks Alfred if he'd rather get hurt in this way by the playhouse, or face his terrible reality, a reality where he'll also just get hurt in the same way. Dictator Alfred, who I'll henceforth be referring to as Pickles, an alternate alias for him, explains to Alfred that the residents of the playhouse aren't real, and that the playhouse only exists to keep Alfred from doing horrible things. Pickles goes on to explain that Alfred's reality consists of the horrible flashbacks he's been having, such as the popsicle incident. The reason why Alfred couldn't remember this happening is because the playhouse is deliberately in place to prevent him from experiencing these horrible memories and realities. In Pickles' words, they fight to serve him. Pickles starts to break down and explains to Alfred a more specific reason as to why he can't remember what had taken place with that popsicle. It happened to me! I was filling in for you with your alter personality, training in your body, throwing a frozen cold fruity with this popsicle, and meanwhile you were dancing the polka with Jerry Seinfeld unicorns! Pickles lives a horrible life. He exists solely to fill in Alfred's body whenever he's experiencing a traumatic event so that he can go through it whilst Alfred frolics in his own imagination, completely oblivious. And this scene in particular is why I feel that a lot of people with dissociative disorders can actually strangely resonate with the material. Take this comment on Emily's YouTube upload of the video, for example. I have DID and this episode really hits hard. I remember nothing. My alters remember everything. They jumped in the way so that I could live. It gives you a kind of survivor's guilt 
felt despite your alters also being a part of you. It's a real experience that people have to deal with, one that I can relate to heavily myself, as a lot of my own traumatic experiences are ones I can only really remember in glimpses due to the fact that I would frequently dissociate just to get through those moments. And while I definitely can't say for certain that many people with DID have alters who become resentful, power hungry, and acquire a drive for revenge after being essentially psychologically forced to endure traumatic experiences the way Alfred's dictator alter does, there's enough emotion in the scene for this to resonate with a surprising amount of people. Alfred is given a genuine dilemma here, to accept his gruesome reality or to continue letting his body suffer while his mind is blissfully unable to conceptualize these horrors. Pickles offers him a treat and immediately Alfred, despite an understanding that none of this is real and submitting will lead to him being constantly hurt and tortured for the rest of his life, accepts it and in turn accepts Pickles' brief moment of affection. He sees his true self, sees how disgusting and pathetic he finds himself to be, but Alfred doesn't care. A single moment of love, of false affection and hope, and instantly Alfred finds himself back in the playhouse. The series ends with an acceptance of this cycle of trauma and pain, accompanied by happiness is a warm gun by the Beatles. The animation and audio quality are remarkably poor, and despite the overall early 2000s Newgrounds lack of polish, the ending to this trilogy still holds up as a genuinely gut-wrenching and tragic, incredibly human even ending. The series, despite its beauty at times, is very, very controversial, and for reasons I really can't argue with. The visuals depicted within it are so disgusting and over the top, it's really debatable whether or not this level of abuse shown throughout the series is, uh, necessary. But perhaps the most controversial and most heavily debated topic regarding this particular show to this day is whether or not it's actually a vent show meant to resemble Emily's real-life traumatic experiences. There is a certain fact about Emily that I had been neglecting to explicitly mention until this point in time. At an incredibly young age, Emily would become a victim of assault, allegedly at the hands of her very own father, while her mother was in the hospital. This event would force her to rapidly mature at a time where being mature meant that you were extremely edgy and knowledgeable of things you really shouldn't have been at such a young age. This would lead anyone down a dark and dangerous path, and it's very likely that Alfred's Playhouse, as well as many other of Emily's works, came to be because of a reflection of her own emotions a desperate cry for help. Emily Yukis herself has stated that the show isn't a vent or way of coping, but on other occasions has completely contradicted herself, so we may never know what the actual creator thinks of this specific debate. The reason why so many people debate this topic is because a large amount of people believe that the show shouldn't have a quote-unquote fandom because it was created as a way to cope. I can absolutely see both sides of this argument because on one hand, I don't believe this creation should ever be seen as something enjoyable or even romanticized but on the other hand, I see no issue with people latching on to the idea of this show in order to find comfort or solace within their own trauma. It's also important to take into account that a lot of people speak on behalf of Emily, saying that she doesn't want people to be fans of her work, which is just a lie. Regardless of what you think of the series in this particular debate, Emily Yukis would continue to create after the popularity of Alfred's Playhouse. In 2008, no Alfred content would be released, however 2009 was stuffed to the brim with it. These Alfred animations would include Alfred Christ, a short animation music video set to acceptable in the 80s of Alfred, well, being Christ, and rising from the dead. It absolutely reeks of early Newgrounds Flash animation, this is a good thing. Alfred Christ 2, an actual schizo post that is completely unintelligible, announcing of Pickles the drummer from Metapocalypse coming soon to Newgrounds with brief shots of Alfred. Alfred Gets Fixed 2, another unintelligible post made set after the original Alfred Gets Fixed, presumably in the afterlife. Alfred Tribute, a collection of Alfred clips spliced together only to end with more of the uh, this shit again. Alfred Destroys Building, which is probably one of my favorites, a more experimental take on an animation style with dubstep music playing in the background. And Alfred's Story of Christmas, a Christmas special Emily made when she was 15 years old that would feature her older animation style, as well as everyone's favorite, Fat Dog. 2010 would only see the release of a single animation, and, um, I'm not even gonna entertain the idea of talking about this one. By now, it's more than apparent that Emily's mental state is completely plunged into one of somewhat blissful insanity, creating genuinely disturbing and confusing content that truthfully would never make sense to most people other than herself. This mental state was even more apparent when taking a glance at the news tab of her Newgrounds account, in which Emily would post gibberish, just absolute gibberish. It's here, however, where in January 2009, she would announce a massive passion project that would serve somewhat as the death of Alfred, the final Alfred short, except it wouldn't be a short. It would be an entire film that she would spend years working on. All right, so here we are, folks. 
For anyone who is interested, because, and it is extremely painful and sad, some people think that Alfred is dead, that I've resorted to a life of pure spam and he shall never come again. It did not hit me so hard as when I saw that the only things for 2008 were spam. Yet I love my spam, I love it dearly, but let me tell you now, folks, Alfred is not dead. In fact, he is more alive than ever, and he has been resurrected. And let me tell you now, folks, I'm going to kill him. This is going to be the last Alfred short. No, it's not a short, actually. It is a film. It will take me years, and it will perhaps be an hour. And he will die, and it will be the last of Alfred which motivates me all the more. I have come to the age in life of supple ripeness, and I feel that this is the time to commit to my epic work, the epic work of Alfred. And folks, let me tell you, in fact, I cannot tell you, for to verbalize it is to reduce it. I cannot talk about it with anyone, really. It is just that personal. To say how masterful it will be makes it seem preposterous, and to describe it in words is to bring it out into the external reality that is not my head, and thus kill it. Kill the magic, at least. It is not strung together linearly, so I do not think I could barely describe it verbally if I tried. This new thing is so very personal, so from the core of me, and yet so beyond me that it is almost completely cut off from the rest of my existence. However, that existence is rather fading. As lightly due to something in my mind, I've been out, seen college and life, and got bored like everyone else. I've been focusing every increasingly around this new conception, and it is taking over my life. For throughout my college misadventures and things during this first semester, I have learned to sort out all of my confused wants, and see that all I really love is doing this show, which makes me love everything else in return. And I think it is one of the only things that really matters at all in this world. I talked about it before in my last post, and I must say that where it was in my head when I wrote that is but a stale skeleton compared to what I have now. And I am sure what I have now will be but a stale skeleton compared to how it will be in its finality. I say it will be a masterpiece, the story of the century, a work of genius. And yes, looking back at those words now, it seems absolutely and that I am schizophrenic like my brother who told the school children he was Jesus and drove everyone away from him because he kept asserting he was their savior and bow down. Yes, looking back at those words, the external words, it seems insane. Illogical. Why doesn't everyone just rot into mundane oblivion when they age? This surely is just a youthful fantasy, but no, good sir. Like I said, to write that down in text is to bring my divine conception into the external world. And like I said, that kills it. And so I've learned not to condemn the improbable. And I think the only way to keep my improbable vision for this show is to not condemn anyone else. And that includes the small chance that maybe my stupid, insane brother is Jesus. Who knows? Anyway, yes, daily I get divine, blissful bouts of inspiration and spew out stuff and poetry, and it feels like orgasmic ejaculation. And I can definitely say those ejaculations will only get more orgasmic. So sadly, you won't see any real Alfred for a long time. This post would devolve into Emily talking about her attraction and fascination with a fictional character. This post, as well as Emily's countless amount of others consisting almost entirely of spam and gibberish, would provide some interesting insight into her life at the time. This most recent post notably mentions Emily attending college. Leading up to her college attendance, Emily would look for ways to make money, as she had never had an actual job beforehand. Enter the Pistachio Girl, the name given to Emily by faithful Phyllis fans. She would begin her job as a pistachio vendor and sophomore year, stating that she was looking for pretty much any job that would come her way. She would quickly grow to love this job as it suited very well to her energetic, eccentric personality, and she would proclaim it to be quick and easy cash. While selling pistachios, she would sing, cheer, dance, and do anything else that brought a positive force to the baseball games she attended. Her pistachio girl persona would become somewhat famous within the tightly knit community, and she'd soon be off to the Temple University to study the arts. In college, Emily would form an underground punk band inspired by the likes of Gigi Allen, an artist whose music she had used in animations previously. This band was known as Emily Pucus and the Vagrants, and it's pretty standard stuff. It sounds akin to a TikTok screamer vent audio, but it's nothing horribly offensive. Like I said before, Emily does have a very gifted singing voice. 2011 saw the release of a single cartoon, Alfred the Creator, an animation that is it's just it's just absurd, over-the-top It would be the first appearance of another one of Alfred's edgier alters, Lucifer, a character whose only personality trait is sex. In 2012, Emily would graduate from university and a noticeable change in art style would appear in her animations. This year saw the release of two Tyler of the Creator animations, a short film and, uh, Eat My Rotten Meat 2012. I'm not gonna get into this one, but it's kind of important for the development of Emily's artistic style, as pretty much all of her work going forward would follow these themes. Just 
Think of something gross. It's probably in this video. I'm pretty certain this video is the burn she had been hyping up for so many years. Even the comments on new grounds aren't very supportive. 2013 was a big year for Emily, as this would be the very year we would first see her progress on the Alfred Alpha movie, the movie she had been hyping up so drastically. She also got banned off 4chan, so probably for the better. On February 17th, 2023, we would get our first ever clip from the Alfred Alpha movie, Alfred's Big Surprise. The first completed clip from the Alfred Alpha movie to be released non-sequentially, because that's how I do, over the next two to three years on Newgrounds.com. When it's finished, it will be reordered as per my brain sees fit and released fully across the internet. It will be the first animated music video musical ever. I've been writing it since I was 17, right after Alfred's Playhouse. Finally, it is commencing. Stay tuned, folks. The Alfred Alpha movie was completed out of order, each clip releasing at random intervals. I'm going to be simply discussing the movie as it is edited from start to finish, but keep in mind that each scene was not completed in the order they appear. So, the Alfred Alpha movie, what is it? Another disturbing yet realistic and gut-wrenching relatable watch? A thought-provoking piece of art that tackles its subject matters in a sensitive and understanding way? God, I wish! The Alfred Alpha movie is essentially Alfred's playhouse if it was 100 times more graphic graphic and edgy purely for the sake of it being graphic and edgy. The plot is beyond confusing, but to sum things up, it's about Alfred plugging himself into the internet to become the most famous n cartoon dog star in an attempt to be beloved by all of his adoring fans in the real world. This movie serves as a testament to Emily's decaying mental state, and would be essentially the last project she would work on before turning to a life of crazed political views. Another quick warning before we get into discussing this movie, as it's probably the most hard to watch portion of this entire video, especially if these topics in particular are too much to listen to. Go ahead and skip this section if you need. The movie begins with a sick, twisted parody of American Psycho, a cover of the song Sasudio playing some similarly to the same scene in American Psycho. A rather explicit scene if you've seen the movie. So yeah, the movie immediately starts with an animated dog defacing dead people and also Mr. Pickles because Emily Yukis really does not like Mr. Pickles. She thinks that it copied her, which like, Okay. Immediately, it's obvious how much Emily has improved since attending college. As disgusting as the subject material is, it's undeniable that she genuinely has a talent for animation and singing. The character movement is fluid and her style is very unique. It just sucks that she can't find anything else to do with this talent. This transitions into the first part of the movie, which was also the first clip to be posted onto Emily's Newgrounds. The clip begins with Alfred, specifically his girlish, childish alter singing, There Must Be Something More, with a black dog sitting in the front of the vehicle his presumed lover, a dog named Labby. Labby is- oh, oh god. <sighs> I have to talk about it, don't I? Okay. I'll make this quick. Labby is not Emily Yukis' character, in fact, he comes from a very infamous animated horror movie created in 2012 by one of Emily's friends, Jimmy Screamer Claws, where the dead go to die. If you've ever heard of this movie, it's often credited as one of the most disturbing animated films, and you'll likely recognize this particular character, Labby, from it. The movie is essentially just the most shocking, offensive things you can think of, and it's scary because it's shocking and offensive. Which sucks because a lot of the trailer shots actually look pretty gnarly. It could have been a genuine unsettling piece of indie media, but it's... It's like that. I was fully prepared to watch the entire movie to find a 10 second Alfred Alfred cameo because I wanted to make sure I had all my ground covered for this video, but thankfully before I could actually watch anything past the three minute mark, I was sent the exact timestamp of the clip by my editor and spared from my suffering. Thank you. Here's that clip for you. Sometimes people do things to you that feel good, but are actually bad. And when someone does anything bad to you, you just say no. So there you go. Now you don't have to watch this entire hour and a half nightmare for a few seconds of a clip, although I'm sure you didn't intend to in the first place, because you're normal and don't have an intense need to research everything necessary for a video that won't get more than 20k views. Moving on, Labby and Alfred continue singing as they travel down a long road, Labby telling Alfred that it's only a little bit longer until they reach his big surprise. Labby takes Alfred to, well, where the dead go to die, and Labby tells Alfred that in this field, 
his surprise as waiting for him. Immediately, Labby takes off, completely abandoning Alfred on the side of the road. Alfred is incredibly distraught by this, traveling far and wide to find any form of shelter. He's hungry, skinny, and tired, and eventually comes across a watermelon, screaming out into the void about Labby. The watermelon turns out to be alive, and Alfred starts venting about how he was left all alone. The watermelon creature gives Alfred the advice of turning to alcohol. We see Dictator Pickles telling Alfred that he'll forever be alone, and that he needs to return to the playhouse. In the next scene, Alfred takes the watermelon up on his advice and travels to a bar full of dead people. This scene primarily exists just to be an absolute mindfuck, complete with flashing lights, disgusting visuals, distorted audio, all of it. Alfred almost offs himself, but gets distracted by a dead girl on the stage, and the rest of the scene is just disgusting visuals that make no sense in the slightest. A lot of screaming, more distorted audio, drugs, alcohol, bugs, whatever. It's an entire scene of sensory overload for pretty much no purpose. We cut to Alfred waking up after this incident, horrified at all of the dead bodies surrounding him in the state of his own body. However, he quickly appears to switch altars, and we're introduced to an entirely new altar known as Lucifer. Lucifer has one personality trait and one personality trait alone. He has a real, um, appreciation for the deceased. Lucifer goes on to defile a multitude of corpses while a cover to G.G. Allen's Fuck the Dead plays in the background. Alfred's other alters appear to make appearances throughout this montage, and the entire thing is just, uh, well, it's not super fun to watch. It's disgusting for the sake of being disgusting, it's disturbing and edgy and all that stuff for no real reason. I'm not gonna go into the detail about anything that happens in the scene, in fact, I'd rather just move on. Alfred approaches an old-looking building, dragging a massive bag behind him, being degraded by voices in his head appearing as toys in the house, all while well, the television degrades him through advertisements. It soon becomes apparent that this isn't just any house, but the playhouse. Dictator Pickles starts communicating with Alfred directly, telling him he won't remember any of this, and that, as always, Pickles will keep these memories. He informs him that he's being watched by the audience at home and sends him into some kind of electric shock. When Alfred awakes, he appears to be much happier than the night before, but is greeted by none other than Labby. Labby demands that Alfred take the body bag downstairs or he'll get the popsicle. Alfred meekly does as he wishes, crawling along the floor. He's unable to reach his destination, however, as his friends in the walls as well as his toys all start to unfortunately mess with him in utterly disgusting ways. We then get an actually incredibly visually impressive sequence featuring many reminders of Alfred's past, the past that we know, seeing his manager pinned and memories from previous shorts. We enter the basement where Alfred has successfully injected himself into the internet, watching all of his adoring fans and personally sending bombs to his haters. We even see him appear as a 3D model, and thankfully he looks a little better than last time. Alfred enters his playhouse once again, being worshipped while, of course, the imagery and even some Trump-supporting ideologies make themselves known. This is just absurd. And so, the Alfred Alfer movie ends. It just ends. So, what was the plot? Alfred does messed up shit, goes into the internet, and does more messed up shit, and then is saved by the almighty Donald Trump. That's it. All right. That's the end of Alfred Alfer. The only other appearance he would make was in 2015 in a short animated to a cover of Frank Ifield's I Remember You, featuring schoolgirl Alfred made during the production of the Alfred Alfer movie. So what the hell was up with Emily at this time? From the timeline of events, we can gather that Emily started her rapid mental descent around 2016. Though before that year, there were already plenty of signs that Emily was losing it. Take her appearance at Midwest Fur Fest 2015, for example, in which she trolled the entire Fur Fest dressed in an admittedly rather cute Alfred onesie. Her idea of epically trolling, however, would be to, God, I cannot believe I'm saying this. Hump attendees demand that people pet her, roll around, tackle people, and even interact positively with a few people who recognized her. Well, it's nice to see her have genuinely positive interactions with people, she also encourages people to send her Alfred porn, so whatever. She also humps these fans too. Great. From what I can gather, most of these people consented to these actions, but it's still just not appropriate. I shouldn't have to explain why. Like I said before, 2016 would be the main contributor to Emily's descent, and the way she is today. The beginning of the end, if you will. Around this time, she began to express newfound political views and would even express them through her work, hence the strange ending to the Alfred Alfer movie. She would plunge into an obsession with Donald Trump and his ideologies, likely as a result of the 2016 election. However, this wasn't a massive deal breaker for most of her professional relationships. She would still continue working as the pistachio girl and didn't really lose any connections. Emily would reveal that in December of 2015, she would spend hours upon hours a day on 4chan's political board and would very quickly soak up many far right wing ideologies, going as far to share her findings with her gay friends in an attempt to help them out, because in her words, they could get killed in Sweden. It's no surprise that they very quickly cut ties with her. So when I fell in the red pill, I'll say late 2015, I was 
<laughs> at a very low point. I I was you know a little overweight. Uh, I had was smoking so much weed. Uh, I would drink a lot. You know, I had like really you know degenerate friends. Like I would hang out with like gay people and stuff. There was this gay bar I would go to, not because I'm gay, but it was you know like these freaks. I was just like, oh, these freaks, they're funny. <laughs> uh, you know, they were like, and uh, so I was like in the pit of misery and shit. And my animation was stuck. And then something in me snapped again. I was like, I, I need to do some research. So I went on poll and I think I saw, I found out about poll somehow. But I think December I started going on poll. And, you know, once you start ingesting that information, it doesn't really take long. I think it took about, it, it just, finally it, erupted my my synapses and I felt like I was learning again I felt alive again I actually did listen to Milo and I know they say Milo isn't like a a, a gateway but and I don't like Milo I don't think he would be a gateway because most people just stop there they don't go any further but at least he was kind of an in, an introduction to the material and you know I had gay friends so I would try and show them that and I mean they quickly disowned me even when I was like hey you know they got really pissed off when I said that. I'm like, look, I'm just trying to help you guys. Despite this development, Emily's life would seem relatively fine until one fateful animation convention panel hosted at MAGFest 2016. This panel would include several popular animators who found promise on the internet, most notably people such as Chris O'Neill and Vivian Medrano. The entire panel, as most panels are, was filmed from start to finish, and around an hour into it, Emily would be allowed up with the panelists, quickly making everyone in the room uncomfortable. We have no idea if she wasn't sober or if she was just having another one of her breakdowns, but regardless, Emily would go on to scream into the microphone, talk over other panelists, and make absurd remarks, including but not limited to her claiming that Kesha was an Illuminati puppet, advising Vivzy Pop to make NSFW for a better career, having a breakdown over the TV show Mr. Pickles saying it supposedly stole from her, and telling someone, presumably a younger person, that if they hate their mom, I, I'll just let this one speak for itself. Well, if you bad drawing the you hate your mom. Uh, maybe? <laughs> because if you do, fucking That's make a, a thing of- a couple ideas. I love my mom. Get her murdered <laughs> and fucking- yeah. Jesus Christ! Oh my God. <laughs> All right, that was a well, what if you- like Tabo no, <laughs> The panel was an absolute wreck and a perfect demonstration of Emily's mental state and overall complete lack of self-awareness. After the completion of the final clips for the Alfred Alfred movie, Emily would cease posting on new grounds and plunge further into political insanity. She would show up at Trump rallies, harass people at public events, yelling conspiracy theories out into the night. The papers asked her if this was all some elaborate art project or publicity stunt because of how absurd and concerning her actions were were becoming, however, she would quickly confirm that these were her genuine ideologies, and that there was no trolling or stunts involved. As if things weren't bad enough already, she would soon descend as far down the alt-right pipeline as you could possibly get, showing support for white nationalism and including symbols of these groups in the final section of the Alfred Alpha movie. She would be spotted attending white nationalist rallies and would promptly be fired at her job working as the pistachio girl for these ideologies. Her living situation would become just as unstable as her mental state, as she would constantly Constantly move from place to place and would somewhat disappear from the internet, only appearing on various Nazi podcasts from time to time to deliver her much needed opinions or just say about anything. I'm not jeopardize your YouTube channel in any way, but I do think we need to nuke Africa. Clearly, she was too far gone. Emily would try to justify her white nationalism by claiming that she had been bullied and harassed by black people growing up, but in the post where she says this, she quite literally refers to these people as the end slur, so yeah, good job, Emily. We're really going to listen to you on that one. She would seemingly fully devote her life to her political ideologies after 2016, only creating art and animations when they could be tied to her outlandish views, such as a horrid comic called Which Way White Woman, with the tagline, 2% of the world's population is white, child-bearing aged woman. Will you choose to save your race? Yeah, if any of you watching even remotely share these beliefs, watch out, pal. The Leviathans are coming for you. Because of her ideologies and inability to shut the fuck up about hating minorities, Emily would flee to the corners of the internet where her neo propaganda was tolerated and even encouraged. Alfred's story unfortunately ended in 2016, although I'm sure it was for the best. Alfred was at first a charming yet edgy character and concept and a genuinely unique way of exploring trauma that hadn't really been done before. But as seen by the train wreck that was the Alfred Alfred movie, Alfred returning would likely only mean using his likeness to spread hate against groups of people. But what about Emily? It's been eight years since her plunge into politics, so where is she now? Exactly where she was years ago. She's still a neo- she spends her time appearing on podcasts to share her views, and she even has two children fathered by a fellow neo-Nazi. 
a Warren Bala. It's a little bit hard to celebrate their happy family. They host a series on Odyssey that I can only describe as having see video essay thumbnails that are honestly kind of amusing to scroll through and just ponder to yourself how anyone could conjure up these ideas. She even blesses us with anti-Semitic skibbity toilet propaganda. Isn't that great? Emily claims that she's always had these views and that she would grow up bullying Jewish people. However, there's not really much documentation of bigotry online before 2016, aside from edgy jokes and jokes that seem more to be mocking these ideals rather than supporting them. Hell, Emily's entire start seemed to be embracing rap culture and she would often show enjoyment for works created by black musicians and artists, as well as her earlier works being clearly inspired by South Park, a show that, while being offensive and edgy in nature, was specifically curated to mock people of any radical political party. So we don't really have any concrete evidence that Emily was always this far right. The common consensus among most people is that Emily's childhood trauma manifested into a dependence on the internet that led to her discovering an echo chamber of bigotry that she would soon adapt to. CSA is one of the worst things a developing mind can go through, a traumatic experience that embeds itself into your psyche and can unintentionally turn you into a worse person as a result. It's a horrible traumatic experience that I, as well as millions of others, will have to live with for the rest of our lives, and a victim, especially at the ages of around 15 to 18, when Emily was most prominent on Newgrounds, will often scream into the abyss for any kind of help, even if they or others don't realize it. I don't believe Alfred or any of his animations were necessarily created with the intention of being a vent show. However, I am positive that these animations would either not exist or not be anything like the way they are if Emily had not grown up in such a horrid environment. She would spend hours fighting with commenters who told her she was sick and twisted, a disgusting, irredeemable monster at the age of 16, and those who weren't demanding her to off herself were encouraging her to go even deeper, to get more graphic with her animations and scavenge the worst corners of the internet. Monsters aren't born, they're made. And in another timeline, maybe Emily wasn't beyond saving, but the fact still remains that, unfortunately, Emily is not a good person, and I feel like this is a fact that a lot of people are somehow managing to forget. If you are a victim of a traumatic situation and find comfort and solace in the portrayal of that trauma within Alfred's Playhouse or similar works, that's totally okay. You can still enjoy these works, but I ask that you realize the kind of woman you're choosing to forgive if you comment on Emily's TikTok saying that you'll always support her. Alfred Alfer has become unattached from Emily and her actions at this point, spawning a community of people who resonate with the character while despising her ideologies. And I think that's fine, so long as you aren't hurting anyone else or yourself. The internet is horrifying. Fall into the wrong corners and there's a good chance you may never recover. Even on surface level social media sites like Twitter, some of the most disgusting, horrific things get posted and shared every single day. And all we can do is attempt to escape the hostility and hatred before it consumes us completely. I hope you'll take Emily's story as a cautionary tale, and I hope that you're never afraid to reach out for help if you need it. Just don't try and find that help from strangers on the internet. I beg. As always, thank you so much for your time. I've been Kuniman, and don't forget to stay safe, stay smiling, and above all, Stay spooky. Three, two, one, go!